Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fire and Rice. We're here with Dr. Bob Ekblad. Wow. Woohoo. He doesn't want to be called doctor. We call him Bob. <laughs> Welcome, Bob. Hey. Thank you, Eugene. Yeah, we don't really need to introduce Bob. Yes, we do. Because his name has already come up quite frequently. So Bob is a director of the People's Seminary, also serves as a part-time chaplain at Skagit County Jail. So are you still teaching at Regent, Bob, as well? No. I'm oh, not. not anymore. Okay. But at Seattle School? No. No, not anymore. Okay. And Westminster Theological Center. I still teach there and some at Seattle Pacific Seminary. Okay. Yeah. So you're an associate professor at West, Westminster Theological Center in the UK. Yeah. I think it's just lecture or something. They call me. Oh, what do you teach there? I teach a course called Lift Up Your Voice. It's on prophetic ministry in scripture and society. Okay. Okay. So more personally, I started experiencing in a profound way, the power of the Holy Spirit in my life when I lived in Montreal, Quebec. This was almost 20 years ago. And I didn't know what to do with myself. And a friend of Sarah's, her name's Ginny Malian, said, you could have talked to Bob. And this was somebody I trusted because you know, I grew up in the Father, Son, and Holy Scripture camp where everything had to be biblical. And I was an anti-charismatic type of person. It was like, I hated those who spoke in tongues. I hated those that kept saying, God said this and God said this. I hated anything charismatic. And then I became one of those <laughs> people. <laughs> and it started, it started happening to me. I started seeing angels, started doing all this deliverance ministry. Uh, when I was in Montreal, Quebec, I would stand up at service on Sundays and then God would give me these words to share that would just come out of nowhere and I would deliver them on the pulpit and there would be mm -hmm. people just break down in front of me because it was like a specific word from God for them. And I didn't know what's happening. And Jenny says, you got to talk to Bob. Gave me the Bob's phone number and I called Bob, not expecting him to call me back. And he just called me back. And then that was the beginning of amazing friendship where he started to really mentor me and disciple me and, and show me in scripture that the things I was experiencing was actually part of God's truth. And I didn't have to have a dichotomized life. I didn't have to be afraid of the, the experiences. So Bob, I have to thank you for first taking my call and just all of the wisdom that you've bestowed upon me through the years, really shepherding me and really giving me a balanced theology. And I'm, I'm continuing to, to grow under your, your leadership and your, the theology that you embody. I know you don't like to hear this right now. Bob's going like, ah, don't put too much, you know, pressure on me or like even the word of being under him and all that. He doesn't like that. I call him my Yoda in a way, you know, <laughs> if I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's, he's like the Yoda for me. One of them. Y'all have already heard the story of me being set free at Tierra Nueva. Mike Neely and I, we talked about it. Also, my, I, sh I shared in one of our workshops about the, the horse spirit that also I was delivered from the Chinese Zodiac. That was with Bob, where he taught me how to do deliverance ministry on myself. So we've got many, many stories of doing God's work throughout the world. I've had Bob come to Seoul, Korea to be a conference speaker at my church when I served at a church called Jubilee. Also Taiwan, Taipei, Taiwan. And Sarah, my wife, has also served on Bob's board with Tierra Nueva. And so I don't know what else I can say about Bob. Y'all heard about him. I'm not, I don't mean to pump him up so much, but uh, it's just uh, what it is. Bob is Bob. With all that to say, Thank you so much for making the time to come and speak to us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I think today there's two things on my heart I want to first talk about is maybe you can share a little bit of your story with the Holy Spirit for everyone because you're an Old Testament professor and you and I had similar experiences with being in a tradition that was more dry and did, wasn't, didn't have a robust theology of the Holy Spirit. And maybe you can share mm -hmm. a little bit of that story of how you started to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit more and 
the catalyst for that? I grew up in a family where I guess it was more like scripture and like an evangelical church in the United States near Seattle suburb. So I remember having hands laid on me by these different people and tongues being a big feature of that. And uh, it's sort of that never happened to me. I didn't like kind of uh, break out in tongues. And so I, I think I felt the sense of being excluded. Like it says, many are called and few are chosen. That was a toxic text for me. I kind of thought, well, maybe I'm just not one of the chosen. Then I think I, 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 I witnessed things just growing up in the church as a kid that caused me to, I guess, lose faith in the institution of the church, you know, just because I saw hypocrisy and I felt myself excluded by the evangelicals, not just the charismatics. It wasn't the charismatics that excluded me. It was more like I felt like I just didn't have that experience of the spirit, you know, that was supposed to be the sign, I guess, of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Mm. That didn't happen to me, even though I felt like I was open to it. Are you speaking more about tongues itself? I was speaking about tongues, yeah. And I think that in Pentecostalism was the main sign that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that you speak in tongues. And so anyway, I remember being at a full gospel businessmen's meeting with my dad, watching this speaker get up. This is a, a room full of men in business suits. My dad was always very well-dressed with a business suit, and I was just a young kid with him. And the man up at the front started prophesying, or what he called prophesying. He started naming and pointing to men in the crowd that were having, aff- he said, were having affairs. Wow. And he was like pointing them out. I remember as a kid just feeling the terror and the shame. I remember just feeling like I want to hide underneath my table because I thought he's going to point to me and say, there's a little boy here who has grown up in the church, but he's never come forward because he's too embarrassed to come up into the front of the church and to an altar call. And I just wanted you to know, little boy, that if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. I was kind of a, that was another toxic text for me, right? Oh, man. And so I thought, okay, I want nothing to do with any of this kind of stuff. And I closed my heart to that a second time. So my first time was in a way closing it because tongues didn't happen to me. And then seeing this kind of prophecy happening, it was very shaming, mm. terrified me as well. Mm. And then I grew up in a very God and country sort of Republican family, Republican party, where I was part of that too. I mean, I was an Eagle Scout, so I went all the way through the scouting. So, you know, I was pledging allegiance to the flag every day. And then I was a history major in college and learned a lot about what the United States Mm -hmm. was doing, had been doing around the world and learned things like, you know, we didn't really just jump in and to try to defend the Jews from the Holocaust. That wasn't our main motivation for entering World War II. In fact, we entered really late because we were, we were allowing the Nazis to, to massacre. 30 million Russians were killed in the Nazi offensive. Mm. And that was something we allowed and, and we were happy about in a way because we wanted the Soviet Union to be beaten down. And just learning lots of little things like that caused me to become increasingly critical of our country, right? And to the point where I ended up in Central America feeling called as a missionary there when we were there. The United States was supporting dictatorships, all the dictatorships in the region, and that were very brutal and responsible for the disappearances of anyone who's a social justice person or guerrilla, you know, fighters and activists, but also Catholic priests and Protestant pastors who were bold enough to be critical of the injustices. And when I witnessed that, began to feel a call to work with the poor. What I saw was that white charismatic evangelicals and evangelicals in general in the United States were mostly in support of the U.S. government's policies. And so that caused me to become even more cynical and critical of, of that world, which felt to me to be off on, a, on a, the wrong track, siding with the powers and principalities and almost like the white you know, slave traders that would bring African slaves and consider that to be just completely compatible with Christian faith, which they did. They thought that British slave traders and North American slave traders and 
or just settlers that came and felt like they could justify genocide of Native peoples. Colonialism, the whole colonial heritage, what I saw was that white charismatics were basically in that same camp of theology, justifying the powers that were colonizing indigenous peoples and then oppressing the poor. And so um, that caused me to really become increasingly disillusioned with charismatic Christianity. And then the Pentecostals, they were calling me and Gracie really negative names because we were preaching the gospel of God's love and forgiveness and grace to sinners. So we would be called the beast, la bestia. <laughs> you know, and the people would say, Roberto, la bestia. That they call me Roberto and is the beast and the 666. And so I was watching them pray for the sick and people were claiming to be healed and them claiming to be the anointed ones. But then they had this super uh, legalistic theology. So anyway, my whole experience with charismatic Christianity was negative pretty much. Except that I noticed that a lot of the people that would come to faith in those circles would get free from stuff like alcoholism and, and they would become turned on to an active faith in a certain way. So I was perplexed. I saw the empowerment of the spirit that came through Pentecostalism in Central America. And so I think it was actually seeing the impact of the spirit on the poor, despite the legalism that caught my attention a bit. Mm, you couldn't deny the, the power of God that was that you were witnessing in spite of the negative depression, the legalism that you were experiencing. Yeah, like there was a guy named Lisandro, Lisandro Guzman, who was a known assassin who had come to our agricultural committee meetings. And, and it was because he came that I was asked to lead Bible studies. And that's how I got into reading the Bible with people. He came to faith and then became a Catholic delegate of the word, which is a Catholic lay worker. But then because of, of a change of popes and a pope that became more conservative and was getting people back into traditional Catholic practices like praying to Mary and stuff, He ended up jumping ship and being the leader of this huge renewal movement. And so I saw just what happened to him and his movement that he led. That impressed me. I mean, it touched, touched me to see a guy like that. He benefited from whatever we were doing, but, but then kind of went way further and faster and deeper with the move of the Holy Spirit in his circles. Yeah, that was quite a lot of barriers and walls to overcome with regards to the things of the spirit. How did you break through? Today, I see you very integrated and balanced, both scripture and full-on power of the Holy Spirit. How did you get to that point? And how do you think through all of the legalism and some of the negative things? Because I think our listeners, there is the two camps. There's the frozen chosen, and then there's the charismaniacs. Those are very uh, obnoxious terms, but full-on charismatic, but it can also be legalistic as well. And you can also have pride in your charismatic practices as well, which can turn people off the wrong way. But then some people, it might just be their own insecurity too with what you don't know. Sometimes it's you're going to be criticized no matter what, and you're not going to like it no matter what, just because you don't understand it. And there's no one there to guide you through. So you're just going to put a wall up against the things of the spirit, or maybe I should say the charismatic practices of the spirit. So how, how, how did you overcome that hurdle? I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of walls for you to be able to break through. And just for the listeners, just part of my story, when I was asking God for more to equip me with something because my current faith was not good enough. And that's when I actually, I think Drew posted a, a video about Bob Eckblad. It was Liberating Fire and it was about Bob's story. And so I was actually, I think, watching that story about Bob, that's what actually softened my heart towards, I think, the more charismatic circles, because I had all those presuppositions and mostly rightly so uh, <laughs> that because me and my California upbringing, I'm very um, sensitive towards kind of the political spectrum and kind of where a lot of the kind of charismatic stuff kind of seems to reside. And so oh, definitely Charlie. seeing Bob's story, hearing about it, really kind of changed my heart. And that's when I was like, okay, God, I think I'm ready. I know you'll protect me. And so let's hear that story, Bob. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, part of my, our journey was we were in Central America all through the 80s and 
then felt called to study theology, moved to France, and were in a very academic and scholastic biblical studies theology school. I mean, we received a lot of excellent teaching and grew in our ability to read scripture. We gained so much from that experience and at the same time felt a calling to return to the United States and to actually continue working with people who were poor and marginalized, excluded people. So 30 years ago, almost this month, we moved one hour north of Seattle and began a ministry to immigrant workers. And I became chaplain of the jail. That was like a hugely transformative journey where we saw that with all the education we had, even the experience up to that point, it wasn't really cutting it in terms of us seeing freedom and liberation for the people we were serving, let alone, you know, our, for ourselves as we were trying to raise a young family and just deal with all the stresses of parenting and being married and having little kids and being workers, you know, having to bring in income and all that stuff, right? So just being humans and then being in ministry where we're working with people in our prison system, jail system, and immigrant workers who are mostly undocumented, who are being harassed a lot and being arrested and deported. And what we saw was the messages we were bringing to people of what we understood to be the gospel. Those messages were impacting the people and us. However, there was, you know, the powers of the drugs that people were consuming that were landing them in jail, like at that point it was heroin and, and crack cocaine, but then it soon became methamphetamines and now it's fentanyl. I mean, and anyway, the drugs in many ways felt like they were more powerful than the gospel that we were bringing. And in a way, what we experienced was just a feeling like we were just losing. We were losing. We were on the losing side. And the casualties were the people that we were growing to love more and more as we were hearing their stories and getting to know them. And so that caused uh, my wife, Gracie, and I to become more, well, despairing, just feeling like, okay, I have a PhD in Old Testament and we're both ordained Presbyterian pastors and we've got 10, 12, 15, 20 years of experience and we're failing. You know, we're not seeing people get free. We're seeing them being warmed by the good news and saying yes to it, but then they get out of jail. And they go right straight back to the same addictions and the same problems. And they reoffend in a worse way or they relapse. And so it's like, what's up with that? Jesus, we looked at his witness in the Gospels and, you know, like dealing with a Gerasene demoniac, I mean, who he casts out legion of demons from. And, and then the guy's empowered and sent to be a first to first apostle. And Jesus is seeing freedom. He's bringing freedom to people and we weren't seeing that level of freedom. And so we're like in a crisis, both by looking at the Jesus of the gospels who we were claimed to be disciples of and, and then looking at the, the level of brokenness and darkness in our culture and feeling like, um, okay, we're not, we knew we weren't Jesus, but Jesus says, you know, a greater things than I do, you'll do because I go to the father, but we weren't seeing anything close to that. And so we're thinking, well, what are we missing? You know, our education hasn't equipped us to deal with the darkness and we're ready to quit. And so the one dimension that we really hadn't really benefited from was the charismatic body of Christ. And I want to say that, I mean, Pentecostal, somebody's a God, four square, like Catholic charismatic, anything charismatic. Like we had just, I'd shelved that and just thought, you know, no, thanks. There was a renewal movement that was impacting a little brother of mine who would, had gone through crack addiction and mental health issues. And he was the youngest and the least educated and the 12 years younger than me. He went through a conversion experience and he began to challenge me about my theology and saying, you know, like, you know, do you worship and do you believe in the Holy Spirit and do you pray for healing? And I was like, I mean, yeah, I, I worship. And he says, yeah, but do you worship? And I was like, well, what do you mean worship? You mean like pledge allegiance to the flag and support the Iraq war and dance around in a building and sing praise songs? I mean, I was very cynical, right? And, but he says, no, you know, I think, Bob, you know, you need to, you need to worship God. Like I'm in this setting where we're just worshiping. It's so powerful. And and like, I'm seeing all this healing. I mean, do you pray for healing? I'm like, well, I believe in it, I guess, but I 
guess I don't really pray for healing. And he challenged us to open ourselves up to this part of the church that he was being impacted by. That was uh, kind of epitomized by the movement out of Toronto, the Catch the Fire movement at that time. So he talked us into opening ourselves up and going to a conference. And so my wife went first and then I followed after she came back and reported that there was a lot of good that she witnessed and wasn't all negative. And I mean, there's a lot of good. Both of us were very uh, wary. Yeah, because she had a Pentecostal grandmother who was really legalistic and who was a pastor. And so she saw the legalism mainly of that world and sort of black and white thinking. And But yeah, we were both very skeptical. Well, she actually went and when she came back, she prayed for me the night she returned. And I'd, I'd had an obstructed nose my whole life where I couldn't breathe through my nose. At night, I could never just sleep with my mouth closed or anything. It's, and so she prayed and, and my nasal passage just opened up right then and there. And it was like, wow, that's crazy. And, you know, she was uh, like at this conference where they were teaching about, you know, how Jesus gives us authority and to heal the sick. And, and that comes through the spirit, through surrendering to the Holy Spirit and through. And that's what happened at Pentecost, you know, being a disciple of Jesus. Without that being empowered and clothed with power from on high, as Jesus describes it at the end of Luke, you know, he says, wait in Jerusalem to your clothed with power from on high. I didn't want power. You know, I was a guilty white American who thought power was the most destructive thing and that I needed to be about non-power. Yet I saw that we needed the power of God that would bring freedom and liberation to people. I was stuck. I, I knew I needed a certain kind of power, but I didn't trust the power that the charismatics claimed they had because it was associated with being pro-Iraq war at that time and strutting around on a stage and looking really powerful man of God or whatever, woman of God. It was associated with cultural manifestations of power that bothered me. So I didn't trust it. Anyway, so I went to this conference finally, even though I knew that I was going to see things that bothered me. I felt like there was enough reason to open myself. And it was in Canada. So what was the conversation you were having with God then? It was like, did you feel like God was calling you to that? And you're like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I felt like God was calling me. Then I was saying, well, there's a lot of bad. And, and I felt like God said, look, if there's 99 things that are terrible that you disagree with, but one thing that would turn your life around and change your life, would you go for the one thing? And I said, okay, yes, I would. If there's one thing, even if 99 things are bad, felt like that's what God told me. <laughs> How long since your wife came back? She came back in November. She went to the 10th year anniversary of Catch the Fire. And then she said, I should go. So I went to the 10th year anniversary of the Pastors and Leaders Conference in Toronto, 2004. So 20 years ago. So I went and first thing I noticed was the worship uh, actually really, really powerful. And I found myself worshiping, not with my hands in the air, because that was just culturally uncomfortable for me. I just was myself. But I noticed that as I focused on Jesus and as I was able to engage in the worship, I, I found myself feeling like I was being pushed to the ground, like there was a weight or a hand on my back or something. Like if I went with the pressure that I was feeling on me, I'd be on my face on the ground. And I didn't know what that was. Then I began to realize it was, it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> It was like there was a weight of the presence of God, I guess, that I was experiencing as I was worshiping with all these people. But then the first person, the, the leader of the movement, got up and said, I want to welcome all of you guys to this leaders conference and let's all have all the Americans stand up. And so he had all of us stand up, all of us who were Americans, but we were just, uh, there were people from all over the world there. And so I stood up uncomfortably and he said, you know, Thank you. We just want to publicly acknowledge that you are the world's global police force. And we're so grateful that you're in Iraq. And uh, let's give the Americans a round of applause. And so I immediately sat down and I thought, you know, that's one of the 99 things that I was expecting to be bad. But I felt suddenly um, like affirmed in a way because my critique of that movement, it wasn't based on nothing. It was based on a reality that was still present in the, in that movement. In a way, it was like God saying, yeah, you were right. That is there. 
And that is there now as much or more than it was then, you know, that aspect of that movement that is very dangerous aspect of that movement is with uh, what's going on with the political scene in the United States and in Europe and lots of places, the rise of authoritarianism and the belief in violence. Both of those have never been stronger, really, maybe in Christian circles, charismatic circles. But anyway, so the next day there was a speaker, uh, Randy Clark, he was speaking on healing and deliverance in the Gospels. And he was speaking in a way that very biblical using scripture to show, to support this idea that, you know, that the church was really birthed with at Pentecost, you know, when the spirit came down on all the believers that were gathered after Jesus had ascended to heaven, to the right hand of the father. And, and when the Holy Spirit came and filled the believers, then from then on, they began to minister like Jesus had in the power of the spirit and healing and casting out evil spirits and proclaiming messages that were courageous and, you know, the gifts of the spirit, prophecy, everything. Everything was the book of Acts shows us uh, an empowered movement of Jesus followers who were acting in alignment with the Jesus of the Gospels. Jesus, you know, the way he was being continued because of the Holy Spirit's being poured out. And uh, anyway, he was illustrating that. And and I knew that was all true. I saw that I was I was in agreement with that message. I just didn't know how to live into it for myself. And. So he was getting what he called words of knowledge, which I don't think they were, that's what they were. It's more like prophetic revelations he was getting. I think word knowledge is something different. It's more like a a message uh, that God gives for a particular people group or setting that is a a liberating message of an articulation of the gospel. But prophetic, he, he was getting prophetic words about healing of different individuals and calling people forward who had those conditions and praying for them right on the spot and People were claiming to be healed and it seemed legit. And so at the end, he said, like, our team has come here to pray for everybody and that all of you pastors and leaders who are here can step into the empowered life of the spirit. And so come forward or go to the back of the church, wherever you want to go, just line up and we're going to be going to a time of ministry. So I remember just being kind of terrified and thinking, well, what will happen if I let them lay hands on me? Will I become a right-wing Republican pro-violence person, a fundamentalist or, you know, black and white legalist. I had all my fears were there. And then I thought, you know, I liked the way the guy, Randy was, Clark was speaking and thought he was, had a lot of integrity. And, and I came here because I wanted to step into the ministry of Jesus in a fuller way. So I said, oh, okay, I'm going to go line up at the back. I'm not going to line up at the front. So I went to the back and I was in a big line of people and was watching some guy who was the ministry team guy praying for down my line, kind of walking towards me, maybe a hundred people were in the line and people were all falling who he was praying for falling backwards. And I was like, no, thanks. I am not going to let that happen to me being slain in the spirit or whatever. But then I thought, you know, why am I so afraid? And I said, well, for good reason, because I don't trust. But then I thought, you know, I'm just going to pray to Jesus. I'm just going to say, Jesus, so I prayed the Jesus prayer that I practiced a lot. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of God, protect me from anything negative that these guys are carrying. I only want the true and the good and, and the, what comes from you. I want, I want Holy Spirit, I welcome you. But Jesus, help me, save me, protect me. And I was praying away, right? And just not worrying about what was going to happen to me and trying to be willing to surrender and trust because I think a lot of what I was feared was losing control too. Like the idea of falling and being overcome by the spirit was in a way, it was my own pride that was at stake. And what was going to become of me? Would I look, look like someone I didn't want to look like? Would suddenly I be one of these people shaking and flopping on the ground or, or speaking in tongues and publicly and looking like someone that I had mocked in the past? In the recent past, <laughs> a lot of it was my fear of surrendering. But on the other hand, I was ready to surrender. I was 46 years old, I think, at that time. And I was uh, tired and feeling like I was failing in a big way. I, and it wasn't like I was just feeling like it. I was failing. I wanted to see more fruit in my life and my ministry. So there I was. I was praying away and the guy got to me and he 
didn't even touch, put a hand up towards my head. And he just, he's a young British guy. And he just said, I see you in a circle of men in red uniforms, sitting on blue plastic chairs. I think they're prisoners. And I was like, whoa, that's what I've been doing like numerous times a day. I mean, a week going into the jail, meeting with guys and we've read jail fatigues and sitting on blue plastic chairs in our jail multi-purpose room. And, and my heart had been broken and deeply touched. I'd been transformed by those, just those men. So he says, I hear the father saying, I love how you love my prisoners. And I was like, whoa, okay, that's crazy. I've never heard anyone from that charismatic camp say anything positive about me. They'd always been like, you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. You know, you don't pray for healing. You're not a true disciple. You're, you're the beast. You're the 666, like you're a communist. <laughs> All I'd heard was negativity from charismatics, right? So here's a guy who's like telling me that God is, loves how I love the prisoners. But it was, it was clearly God that was speaking through this guy because he couldn't have known anything about what I was doing every week for the last 10 years. So then he says, and I hear the father saying, I'm going to give you fresh revelation from the Bible that's going to make your heart and the people's hearts burn. And that, that's my favorite scripture, the Emmaus Road. So I thought, oh man, that's what I want. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. I was like receiving fully, right? At that point, my heart was open. Then he says, and now I hear the father saying, I'm going to give you an anointing for healing so that your words will be confirmed by the signs that follow. And I remember at that point, I couldn't stand up. I was overcome by the spirit. I, I fell backwards. I was on the ground. And I remember just thinking, no, no. And then I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> like, you know, thinking, okay, wow. I just felt this love and I felt like my hands were on fire too. They were like burning and I just was laying there just, and the guy was off to the next person, you know, and I just was laying there in this line of all these other people just thinking, oh my goodness, like, wow, that is crazy. And feeling the burning on my hands and thinking there's a new beginning here. Something's changed for me. And then the rest of the conference was just like more, 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 you know, like prayer people prophesying. Then I ended up seeing this guy from the charismatic renewal movement in France, who I'd known from my doctoral studies, who saw that what was happening to me. And then he invited me to travel with the leaders of that movement, including the guy that had offended me <laughs> and to go to France a month later, since I had my doctorate from the school in Montpellier in France. That led to a shift, I guess, where I began to feel like I, I could trust that God was uh, moving through this connection with this new part of the body of Christ, that I could see that I had something to say to them too, but I had a lot to learn from them first. <laughs> and so that's led to this long journey of friendship and, and also confrontation struggle that continues today, right? Where I've, uh, that part of the, of the witness of the ministry of Jesus is, is a part of, of uh, who I am right now. So anyway, since that time, you know, I gradually began to pray for people. We saw just lots of people receive healing. And then also we've learned that it's complex and healing isn't, it's not always instant. In fact, it often is. There's other dimensions. People have trauma. They have wounds that need to be addressed. There's a need for deliverance sometimes, often. And people need advocacy and they need to have their mindsets shifted. So there's a holism that's required that includes specialties of different parts of the body of Christ and Christian specialties, but psychology and, you know, recovery wisdom and like issues having to do with the courts and immigration law. And there's a holism that is required to walk alongside people and to see freedom and growth for all of us. But it's, uh, I guess I feel that there's a real need for there to be a reconciliation in the body of Christ so that we can, we can benefit from each other's strengths and not be so divided. We're just in our own little silos or, and uh, missing out 
on key and core aspects of what it means to be a follower of Jesus that other people carry. Well, as I'm just uh, talking with you all, I'm just reflecting on something. I, I realized that as a child, I would always hear about the Great Commission. It was emphasized by my family and by the church that we were part of. And I had a, my grandfather's oldest brother. They were all Swedish. Uh, they grew up in, in southern Sweden. My grandfather's oldest brother was a missionary in the early part of last century in Inner Mongolia. So he went over, you know, with his Swedish wife and they had two children. They were living in yurts and like really doing straight up evangelism among the, you know, the Chinese in Inner Mongolia. And his wife and two children died of some sort of disease. And then he went back to Sweden, found another wife, came across on the Trans-Siberia Railway. And um, his next wife had children. And anyway, they all died. And he kept persisting and uh, came back with another wife um, from Sweden. And uh, these Swedish ladies were pretty hardcore. This guy was the sweetest, humblest person. And he was all about helping people come to know Jesus and and be bring come into a place of transformation. And so I think that evangelism was really a big part of my DNA. So the idea of taking the lives of people in war, like say defending ourselves against Russia, Russians, you know, Soviet Union or something, and killing people and maybe having to be a soldier and you know, the Vietnam War was happening in my youth and the possibility of being recruited to be a soldier. Uh, the idea of taking lives of people that weren't, didn't know Jesus was just like, felt like the most horrific thing I could ever think of. Like, how could I take the lives? Well, taking the life of anybody just seems so opposite of anything, everything that I grew up hearing about, about Jesus. I think I was just from the earliest ages of my of my memory. I've been I've just abhorred the idea of taking lives, and so when I heard Christians talking about us needing to defend this, you know, our country or go to war and take lives of people that weren't saved, so to speak, that felt like such a radical contradiction to everything that Jesus taught. That I just had a major problem with anyone who would call themselves a Christian that believed in killing. Okay, and so. It was actually, I believe it was the Anabaptist tradition discovering that where the Holy Spirit was really moving through learning about that tradition, which was very much committed to nonviolence. And a lot of the peace movement in the 60s and 70s that was committed to nonviolence. I think that the Holy Spirit was moving and flowing in a lot of those circles, right? And before that, I was very much influenced by Latin American liberation theology. And I think the Holy Spirit was moving through that movement very strongly and speaking to me, to my heart, about God's preferential option for the poor and the oppressed and the need to come in in a humble way, in a way lower than just like Jesus, you know, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of, of becoming a slave and dying the death penalty coming down low and that liberation theology movement, which to me, the best of it was, was about these Catholic priests and women religious that were giving up all their high positions as heads of cathedrals and university professors and moving into poor neighborhoods. Very much Isaiah 58. This is the fast that I choose to unleash the bonds of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free. Like they were tied into that tradition or as, you know, Jesus's quotation of Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. So the spirit, I think, was very much speaking to me all the way along through these different movements, through liberation theology, through the Anabaptist tradition, which I think brings a correction to some of the abuses of, of say, liberation theology that also justified violence at times. And so, and the evangelical focus on scripture was also very part of, you know, the Holy Spirit was actively there. You know, I mean, I think of last night, my wife, Gracie, preached about spiritual warfare and about how the word of the sword of the spirit is the word of God. And we were looking at how she was pointing out how when Jesus was baptized and he received the Holy Spirit, he was compelled or literally driven into the desert by the spirit 
to be t- where he was tempted by the devil. And, and the way he dealt with the temptations was when the devil said, just turn, if you're hungry, you know, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into rock, into bread. And Jesus responded by saying, it is written. And then he would quote scripture. And his whole strategy, if in, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to combat the tempter was to appeal to scripture, to the written word of God. It is written. Even, not even through like prophetic utterance. It was like he was drawing from the written word of God. So clearly that tradition of valuing the written word of God is a huge you know, inspired aspect of Christian faith. Okay, so there's these parts that we call word, you know, spirit, justice, word, spirit, street in our ministry. But the word part is important. The justice part is important. The spirit part was the part that I felt most uncomfortable with because I always saw it out of balance in a sense. So anyway, I wanted to just bring that in because I, I, I don't think it's just that the spirit is only manifested through the charismatic dimension of the church. There's the contemplative side too, where the Holy Spirit's super active in that the contemplative tradition of Christianity. Wouldn't you say that you always begin out of balance, Bob, because of human nature? I mean, it's like experiencing a new toy. Yes. It's hard to have balance in the beginning. That may be part of this, uh, the spiritual life is to learn balance and to be submitted to the spirit and to not toss back and forth by the waves of everyone's different teaching. And even in first Corinthians, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul. Well, I follow Christ. And you see the early Christians being out of balance. I don't know if I even know somebody that's like fully balanced, even in the beginning with the apostles, you could argue Peter was very imbalanced. (laughs) I don't think balance should be our goal. Nice. What do you mean? I think we should be faithful to, you know, to the, the word of God as God is, as it's written and as God speaks it and as the spirit leads us. And that's going to cause us to emphasize certain things at certain times and, you know, to have a specific message that is precise and that's tailored for a, a particular person or a community. Yeah. So it's going to be, we're going to be bringing correction at times, right? So it, it's not going to be the whole counsel of God every time we speak. It's going to be one tailored, specific word, perhaps, right? That's awesome. So just to see if I heard you correctly, balance isn't what we should be aiming for. I mean, that's like, for me, like, I want to make sure my theology is, is right. I want to make sure my practices are correct. But that's actually not the point, I think, is what you're saying. That comes as you're being directed by God, as you're just you're looking towards Jesus and just following him, and then just being on that path aligns you in the proper way for your current context. And so in practice, that might be you end up on one way or a different yeah. way, but that's not the point, right? It's like, yeah, you're, 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 you're following Jesus. You're not trying to balance yourself out. Exactly. Following Jesus will naturally balance yourself out. Yeah. It's not our role to balance anything out. I think we just need to try to be faithful. I mean, Jesus talks about how important it is to abide or to remain connected to to him, you know, like as the vine, so to speak, using that metaphor of the vine and the branches. Mm, balance, if it comes from a place of control, because sometimes we're, it's also people pleasing and trying to be all things to all people. And it can be come from a shackling control where you're not really listening to God or what God wants you to say. For instance, Christ, when he says, I only, I only say what the father wants me to say. I only see what the father wants me to see. And that, that there's no balance in that. Right. So I understand that part, but wouldn't you say pastoral leadership, Paul, apostle Paul in, in scripture, there is a sense of balancing when he was shepherding the entire people of God, where there was a correction to say, Hey, all right, let's be careful. Charismatics. Did the word of God originate with you? First Corinthians uh, 14 and 15. Or, hey, don't quench the spirit. And he was balancing people as well to have, I want to say right theology, but just to be more godly. Hmm. Yes. I mean, 
I think the Apostle Paul, through his letters, was constantly bringing correction and bringing pieces of the message, of the liberating message of the gospel, emphasizing certain aspects of the gospel that needed to be emphasized, that he felt like his community that he was addressing, his hearers or his readers were needing to hear about. So he was pastoring. That's what pastoring is, is really guiding and shepherding a community through, I guess, emphasizing different aspects of the message, the liberating message, the gospel that, that are needed, right, for a particular season or for a particular individual or community. But balance shouldn't be our goal. Mm. And it depends on the hat that you're wearing, right? Maybe it depends. If you're not a pastor, you don't need to be the one that's trying to balance everybody. If you're a pastor, you shouldn't be trying to balance anybody either. It can be a way to hold people in a state of mediocrity. It can be, and that's the danger. But what was Apostle Paul doing? You don't think he was balancing people? I think he was bringing correction through his message, you know, through, through his epistles and, and emphasizing very powerful articulations of the gospel that were countering certain tendencies towards legalism, towards, you know, believing you could save yourself through obedience to the, to the law of Moses. I mean, that's what he was dealing with a lot is uh, the Judaism of his time that emphasized salvation through adherence to the law, through, you know, through works. And, um, and Paul had, had been one of those people who himself had been enslaved to that sort of performance-oriented faith. It was all about hoop jumping, you know, and he had been affected directly by an encounter with Jesus that, you know, that caused him to just say, hey, all of these things that I considered to be strengths to be gained my racial ethnic identity, my observance of the Torah, the law, being a Pharisee, you know, all the stuff, it's, it's, it's like rubbish compared to the surpassing knowledge of, I mean, knowing Jesus, right? It wasn't balanced, though. It wasn't like, let's have a little bit of law and a little bit of grace. No, it was about really proclaiming the liberating message that would cause people to surrender to the love of God and have their, their whole life flow out of that love of God. So I'd summarize that I think it's an important point for us to understand. Maybe we define balance. We have to be careful. Balance sometimes is another way to keep people mediocre and not fully operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, what you said, Drew, about control is really true. I think balance is often an attempt to be in control. And uh, for me, that was the big issue. Like. I think I was terrified of losing control. Mm. I had so many judgments against uh, the Christianity of my upbringing. Mm. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to become just some crazy person that looked like they were just uh, chattering away in tongues and looking ridiculous. And I didn't want to be embarrassed by just being out of control like that. Yeah. And where my hands waving in the air or something or flopping on the ground, you know, or manifestations, that kind of thing. I was terrified of losing control. But I was also terrified of, I didn't want to become a colonizer or a white supremacist, like let's just kill the ungodly, justifying killing and war and everything. I'd becoming like that, you know, associated with violence. So I was trying really hard just to make sure that I was walking the path that I needed to walk. But that can be about control where I'm just making sure that I'm steering my own life. Okay. Whereas being able to really trust that surrendering myself to the Holy Spirit is going to be good. I wasn't sure that that was going to be good because those that claim to be surrendered either to the Holy Spirit or to scripture or whatever, often were seemed to be surrendered to other things like the American flag or their whiteness or, you know, their social class materialism. And so they claim to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit. But I think what I learned was it was, all of us are a mixture. You know, are we surrendered to the Holy Spirit completely and to Jesus and being a disciple? Or are we also, do we also have other idols? And it's the idols that, that we have that cause uh, the troubles, our, our allegiances. I just want to call, call out here that a lot of the criticisms that Bob had, I think, of certain maybe charismatic circles or something, those are rightful criticisms. And if that's preventing you from pursuing that, just know I was there too. The great thing about Bob's story, and I think of my story too, is that it gets to a point where 
the awesomeness of God is enough that you want to ask for more of that and that you need to depend on God to protect you as you're kind of entering these different circles that you're kind of scared of because, and rightfully so, because your criticisms of, I think, like the political stuff or just the the posture of violence or the posture of power and, and systems of power, those are correct criticisms. But also just know that you too need to be sanctified. So even though you have those correct criticisms, you too, as you follow God more, as you kind of pursue more of that, God will reveal more to you about how you're unbalanced. But what that means is that we end up with a much better faith, one that has been sanctified and it achieves more of the balance that we're not, that's not the point, but you will be closer to be more like Jesus. Yes, that's very beautiful. They said, Charlie. So, Bob, you still have those criticisms today when in you and I's conversation, people flopping around with their, with their arms and emotionalism and barking like dogs and doing all of these sensational, seemingly hyper emotional expressions of their faith. You still have criticism of that today. But it seems like you're not as critical of that as you are the political stuff, that you seem more okay with that than the political ties. Or if they use God's name to, say, justify Republican values or to support the Republican Party. Yeah, I'm more worried about manifestations like fingers on triggers that shoot to kill and hands over hearts that pledge allegiance to a flag and that cause someone to come under the power of a principality where they are unknowingly or beholden to something that is really has nothing to do with Jesus and the kingdom of God. I'm more worried about those manifestations than someone shaking and barking like a dog or in the ground or whatever. Me too. I, I, I treat that as more of a personality. There's, you know, all these different ways of expression. That's a cultural yeah. preference rather than a moral preference. There we go. <laughs> I think the manifestation of hatred is, uh, you know, hatred towards someone that, you know, that is other than you racially or even people's lifestyle choices, you know, like uh, hatred, when that is visible in, in a person who's a Jesus follower, including myself, that's a manifestation that needs to be taken seriously and addressed. You know, hatred and violence and rage and, and superiority and greed and things like that, right? I mean, what are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, self-control, like, like that's what should be visible if we're actually aligned and in, in, in the flow of being attached to Jesus, you know, abiding in Christ and being full of the Holy Spirit. If that includes, you know, some shaking and falling down and that kind of thing, I don't have any problem with that. I used to. I think I was terrified of losing control of myself. I'm less terrified of it now. Fear of man, men, women, people, and wanting to appear like together and respectable. That's something that I think I was imprisoned by that fear of man, fear of whatever. I mean, my, sub, my subculture, the people that I wanted to please and wanted to accept me. I think a lot of us are, are afraid of that. And so we're not really available to do what God would have us do because we don't want to be, look like idiots or be judged. Yeah, I think that's a good differentiation, Bob. I mean, we get so worked up over expression of worship and how people act in a worship service, but then we don't have the same convictions with regards to their uh, politics and them using God for their own political agendas, which, hey, if we're going to prioritize one to rebuke, it's definitely discernment that what one is more important than the other. I've had a question. I guess this is kind of the big question, probably for a lot of our listeners, because it was a big question for me. I think I've settled it myself, but I'd like to hear from you, Bob. It's like, okay, so given these kind of proper criticisms of the political tendencies and tendency towards political power and systemic structures, I'm trying to say this in a diplomatic way, how come these people, why do they have these spiritual gifts? Why is God blessing 
how come it's, it seems to be mostly in these circles that the spiritual gifts seem to be manifesting and and why? Yeah, like the Bethels. And they obviously, God has used them to course correct the body of Christ towards the prophetic, towards the charismatic giftings, which was is very much needed. But at the same time, there's this tie to the Republican Party that's very problematic. So how is God blessing that? Or is God blessing that? Ministry. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He is roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before Him.